If you have your Bibles, we're in Acts chapter number 2, Acts chapter number 2, and when we promote initiatives like this, uh, we, we don't want you to feel like as a church body that we're just trying to force you to do something. Sunday may not work for you. If there's another day of the week, week that works for you that's better because your work schedule or your friend's schedule, then uh, we would encourage you, please, find, a, find another day. But sometimes when we look at the corporate body and say, how do we, how do we motivate and encourage people to stay faithful to uh, being witnesses for Christ? Uh, it's good to have initiatives that we're all on the same page, we're all praying about the same thing, and then it can be somewhat measurable. Uh, we may see um, just relationships beginning. We may see um, uh, one or two people come to Christ because of it. We may not see any of that now, but down the road we may see more fruit from this. In some cases, it might just be a start for you to say, oh, I could do this on my own. I don't need the church to encourage me to be a witness. I can be a witness on my own. And that's really the whole idea is, can we be a witness? But collectively, uh, that God would empower us to be effective witnesses for Him. All right, I've got to get to the message quickly today because we have a lot more to do with the Lord's table, and, and I don't want to uh, slight the Lord's table. This message I prepared specifically to go along with the Lord's table here today, and since we're in the book of Acts, last Sunday evening I preached on this portion of Scripture from a different perspective, so uh, this morning I'll be preaching on it again and uh, giving you a perspective, and the title I've given to this message is Spiritual Unity in Church Community. How do we have spiritual unity in the church community? And we're talking about our own local church. Uh, we have uh, the privilege to study the scriptures. The book of Acts is a history lesson for us about the early church, the inception of the church, the empowering of the church, and, and the church spreading throughout the known world, if you will, at the time ordaining elders and, and uh, uh, establishing doctrine and correcting situations. I mean, it's going to be a wonderful study for us as a church body. Our theme for this year is relaunch. The idea came from my heart as I was thinking, if I was to start the church over again, now going into our 20th year, what would we do differently? Uh, part of that, myself, is learning myself as a pastor, learning our church as a uh, community uh, I keep growing in areas of my own personal faith as well as how we practice our beliefs and our church. And uh, some things that I would have done early on, I have changed some of the methodology over the years because it is important for us to understand and learn our community and also uh, help us to grow together as believers. And so uh, we have seen some great changes that have taken place and a great spirit amongst the people of our church. And so let's talk about spiritual unity in, in, in church community, in our church community. We read the portion of scripture earlier together, as Pastor Mike led us in that. But as we celebrate the Lord's table today, I would like to share with you some thoughts on the early church personality and practices just after the day of Pentecost. Pentecost is noting for the, noted for the great outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon believers it was the fulfillment of the promise of the Father mentioned in Acts chapter 1, verse number 4. And Acts chapter 1, verse 8 speaks of the promise being the Holy Spirit coming upon and empowering the disciples of Jesus for proclaiming the gospel to be witnesses. And that word witnesses there, I mentioned, even means to be willing to go to death for being that witness. Uh, and so we, we recognize in our day and age, most of us are not going to be facing death for being a witness for Christ. We, we, we live in an amazing country, but there are Christians in other countries that have died for the faith very recently. There are some in prison right now because of their faith in Jesus Christ for being a witness for Christ. And they're willing, because they will not deny their faith in Jesus Christ to die if necessary. That's a, wit that's a true witness's as is mentioned in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, that's the witness heart that we should have. I love you, Lord. I know you changed my life. I am not ashamed of you. I'm willing to be a witness for you, even if it means my, my persecution or my death. Now, again, we live in a great country. Most of you will never be faced with that. But we need to also understand the mindset that Jesus empowered the church, the Holy Spirit empowered the church to be that type of witness. That same empowerment, that same mindset is what he expects of us today. Are we willing to be that kind of witness for Christ? And what would that do to our own communities if Christians took that as, hey, this is still for today. This is still how God wants me to be. 
And so as you look at this today, I hope that resonates with you. And as we go through the series in the book of Acts, I hope it resonates with you. So this immersion by the Spirit had an amazing effect on the believers. They were emboldened to speak about their faith in Jesus Christ. And this was so fresh to them. Just 50 days ago, Jesus ascended, uh, uh, from, uh, resurrected from the grave. Now he has ascended up into heaven and said, I, I need to go so the Spirit of God can come and do his work now in you and among you. And so it emboldened them to speak about Jesus. They were enthusiastic about their faith. They weren't someone who hid their Christianity. They weren't someone who was, who was ashamed or shy about their Christian faith. They desired to meet together, to pray, to learn, and to serve together. They had joy. Christians, they had joy. They were happy people. Miles, anybody? Come on. They were happy people because of the Spirit of God in them. Because they walk with God. And, and, and again, I understand this. Have you ever met a person who's newly come to faith in Christ? Lisa, what are they like? They're excited. They're happy, man. I, I can't explain it, but I know something changing here. That's like me. I've got to make a correction. My wife might be in the nursery or something. Uh, I've used the term cro crocodile tears. And my wife says, for 29 years, I've been meaning to correct you on this. I said, what? I said, it's taking you 29 years to correct me on this? She said, crocodile tears is not what you think it is. I thought it was just meant big teardrops. I had no idea. I've used that term for my testimony throughout my years. After I trusted the Lord and Savior, I cried big crocodile tears. She goes, it actually is a negative. She says, it actually means insincere. I said, where'd you learn that, smarty pants? She goes, no, that's, that's the meaning. And I've, I've always forgot to tell you that. Don't use that in your test. I said, for 29 years, you've not told me this. I said, I've said my testimony a hundred times in public and... They all think I'm insincere. Thanks, my salvation. What I mean by that is I was genuine and I had big tears coming out of my eyes. I've got to figure out a new way to say this. But it was real to me. And I knew something changed here. Listen, I was so insecure about my faith and not sure where I was going. And when I finally got it, the Holy Spirit came in and said, and I was excited about it. And people said, there's a change in you. What's up? There was a change. I, I can't explain it. There was a change. But that didn't stay that way. But usually when someone trusts the Lord to save, there's an excitement about it. There's an enthusiasm about it. Same thing when the Spirit of God came into these believers on the day of Pentecost. They were empowered. They were enthusiastic. They were excited about what God was doing. The best thing for you to do, Christian, who's been an old fuddy-duddy Christian, get around a newly saved person. Let them light you back up again. Don't be negative. Oh, you'll get over that excitement. Don't do that to them. Say, so, you know what? I need what you have. Give me more of that. We need to be excited about our faith. I mean, who wants to come to, come to church, be around Christians if we're all down in the dumps or we're always talking about our problems? I want to talk about the blessings of God. Talk about what he's done for you. Talk about the change of life. Hey, even as worse as it is here, I've got heaven to look forward to. Reteach Christianese to those around you. Help them to understand there's positives involved with being a Christian. I remember a couple who attended our church back when we were at the strip mall. Wonderful couple, came to be members of our church, serving our church faithfully. But when they first came, this was months after they came and became members of our church, they said, so we first came to your church and we saw the joy in the people back in the strip mall, very uncomfortable setting. They said, we were just waiting. So waiting for what? We said, we were just waiting to see the real you, your church, come out. They said, nobody could be that happy. Nobody, nobody could really be sustain that kind of happiness. And I said, what happened? We realized it was genuine. We realized it was real. Well, what was, what was their, their, their mindset? The church they came from, sadly, was very negative. The church they came from had a lot of issues, and they, they always felt like they were the only ones right. Everyone else was wrong. Nobody else could, could be as good as they were. But it, it developed a negative attitude in the people. And they said, we have not been in church where genuine joy from the Spirit has been seen. And I felt bad, but they were, they were looking and judging us, thinking, okay, that's not real Christianity. Until they started seeing, and still they started smiling, and still they started experiencing, that's awesome. And our church has done that with many people. And it's a, it's a blessing to see that there's a genuineness that comes from people who really do walk with God. One of the things noted in our text in this very early church was its practice, was its practice. 
Now think about this. The day of Pentecost comes, or they, they have been led by Jesus Christ himself for three years. He tells them he's going away. He, he, he then goes away. They are empowered now by the Spirit of God, but they were so used to Jesus leading them. Now the expectation is that the Spirit of God is going to lead them. Jesus appointed apostles to lead the church. They were first in the church were the apostles. He gave them his doctrine and said, teach everywhere you go, teach them these things. So we have the apostles' doctrine, which was really Jesus' doctrine. And it's the Spirit's doctrine. The Spirit of God now is going to teach men, uh, the, uh, understand the scriptures and, and, and to uh, motivate them to, to uh, go forward with the, the truth. And so in Acts 2, 41 through 47, it gives us a description of the format and the fruit of the early church, unity and community. The unity and community, which I want to focus on. Number one, the unity of the Spirit. Notice what it says here in verse number 41. And they that, what's the word? Gladly receive. This is important. They gladly received what? The word. The word here is talking about the message that the apostle here specifically, I think Peter preached. They, they heard Peter's declaration of the gospel message, who Jesus was from the Old Testament now to this present time. He preached. They understood the word that was being spoken, which was about the capital W word, Jesus Christ. They understood the word of God, mean the gospel message, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, necessary to pay for mankind's sin debt. Jesus' resurrection is something to be celebrated and something so unique and special to Christianity. But then the Holy Spirit coming inside of an individual, that was not done prior to this on a permanent basis. Turn back with me to John chapter 7 or listen as I turn back to John chapter number 7. Jesus had mentioned this to his disciples that there was going to come a time where the Spirit of God would descend and, and, and dwell uh, his people. John chapter 7, verse number 37. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow what? Rivers of living water. But this spake he of the what? Capital S, Spirit, Holy Spirit of God, which they that believe on him should do what? Receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet, what's the word? Given, notice it's in italics, that means that the uh, uh, translators inserted that word to give us understanding, not yet given, it was, it was supposed by the meaning, but they wanted to make it clear for the English language, because that Jesus was not yet what? Glorified, And so we understand that Jesus, when he went back up to heaven, that's where he received his full glorification once again after ministry on the earth. But then he said, in my departure, the Spirit of God will come and he will permanently now indwell those who believe the message of the gospel, that they receive Jesus Christ their personal Savior. Now the Spirit of God will indwell them. Turn to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 13. So those who believe on Jesus Christ will receive the Holy Spirit Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 13, I want you to notice what it says here next. In whom also ye have trusted, talking about Jesus Christ, after that ye have heard the word of truth. What's the word of truth? The gospel of your, what's the next word? Salvation, meaning your deliverance from spiritual death. You receive the message of the gospel. It's delivered you from your spiritual state of eternity without Christ. You've now received the spirit of, of uh, the Holy Spirit of God comes in and dwells the believer in whom also after that ye believed, ye were, what's the next word? Sealed with what? The Holy Spirit of promise. So here we have those who rece have received Jesus Christ as a personal Savior for the deliverance of their sin debt spiritually also are going to receive the what? Holy Spirit. And they are also sealed by the Holy Spirit. Boy, you can't get any more saved than that, folks. When you trusted Jesus Christ, your personal Savior, He not only saved your soul, you had the Spirit of God come in unto you, and He sealed you for eternity. Eternity. Your destiny set if you truly, by faith, trusted in Jesus Christ, death, burial, resurrection. Now the problem comes, living it out for the rest of our life. But that's sanctification. That's living a life that honors God on a daily basis. And that's where we run into trouble as, as Christians. If we don't walk in the Spirit, we will fulfill the lusts of what? 
the flesh. And some of us are very good at not walking in the Spirit and fulfilling the lust of the flesh. And it's not good. We, sh we are poor testimonies of someone who truly has come to Christ. I've been there. Some of you have been there by personal testimony. You've told me some of you might be there right now. I don't know your story, but that's shame on us. And sadly, that shame is then put on God. And so it's important that we understand the unity of the Spirit that comes in this early church because of the outpouring of the Spirit of God, the baptism, if you would, as we've studied last week, they were immersed in the Spirit of God. They received the Spirit of God. They were filled with His Spirit on the same day. And now there is great unity because the people had, a, had, a, a, uh, had been uh, indwelt by the Spirit of God. I have a lot more to go on that, but I, I have to move along. So not only did, were they baptized by the Spirit on that day, but they were also filled with the Spirit for the work God had called them to do. Now, when you trusted Jesus Christ, your personal Savior, you were immersed or baptized in the Spirit. That's a one and done. The filling takes place many times throughout your life. It's actually in that tense in the Scripture. When you see the word filled with the Spirit, it's in an ongoing sense that they had to keep seeking and keep being filled with the Spirit. So again, if you're just thinking as a rational person, well... If I'm, if I'm a true believer, I'm sealed, I know I'm going to heaven, but if I'm not walking in the Spirit, not walking close to God, not, not spending time with Him, not allowing Him to commune with me, then most likely you're going to become weaker as a Christian. and Potentially your testimony is going to be stained because you'll, you'll do the things you should not do or you'll not have the same fervency in your service for God. So under this first one, the unity that is brought by the Spirit in dwelling them to have unity in the church community, we all must receive the Spirit through salvation. Secondly, the attitude of the Spirit. The attitude, and what I mean the attitude of the Spirit, this attitude is produced by the Spirit of God, but it's also something that uh, we see in Jesus Christ, in the Holy Spirit. And that, first of all, is mentioned here in verse number 42. This attitude, what was the attitude of that early church? And they continued, how so? steadfastly. They continued steadfastly. This is something that's a key to us as Christians. If we don't continue as a believer practicing the things as the early church practiced, we will become stale in our Christian walk, we'll become unfruitful in our, in our Christian virtues, we will stop being productive for uh, God's work. Why? Because we're not walking in the things that God told us to walk in. They continued steadfastly. That's why they saw the results that they saw. We'll get into what they actually practice here in just a moment, but I want to talk about this attitude of the Spirit. The word steadfastly, continued steadfastly together, means to persevere, to endure, to stick to it, to persist. In other words, don't quit. How often do we find Christians that made a profession of faith, they got baptized their church, maybe not our church only, but throughout my history of being in different churches, seeing this man, they were like rockets. They were just on fire for God, and all of a sudden we turn around and, what happened to so-and-so? Oh, you didn't hear? No, well, what's going on? Well, they're not even in church anymore. They're not even living for God. They're going back to the world. Like, well, there's one or two things. Either it was an emotional decision that was not genuine conversion to Christ, or... They stop walking with Christ, and now they're going back to the fleshly desires. It's one or two things. Either not saved or saved, but not living for God. It's only one or two things. When people just totally throw it all, the towel in, I have seen some of those people come back around and start living for God again. And we rejoice. Hey, they truly were saved. They just went through a wandering time. That's sad. That shouldn't happen, but it does happen from time to time. Then I've seen others that not only walked away but never came back, and some of them died premature deaths. I'm not saying that was a judgment of God, just the lifestyle they got into, the depression, all that hit them. They just totally got out of it, and actually some of them have made more of a wreck of their life, assuming that they were truly born-again Christians, but maybe genuinely not. But the attitude of the Spirit continued steadfastly. This early group continued steadfastly. They persevered. They endured. They didn't quit on what is going to come next in our, in our text there. But 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 2, talks about stewards. A steward is a manager over someone's affairs. One of the key principles to a steward is, or character trait, that they are to be what? Faithful. Faithful. 
When someone looks at your life, Christian, from the time you got saved to now, would they say, now that is a faithful person? Does God look at you? Forget about us. When God looks at us, does he say, now that's a faithful person? I'm not just talking about your physical appearance at a church service. I'm talking about your daily life. Let's take away our church service. Would God still say you're faithful? Outside of the church walls, outside of your service times. Something that you need to do self-evaluation. Lord, am I faithful to you Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday afternoon? Am I a faithful Christian? God's the one who's looking at that, not us. So with our attitude, are we someone who sticks to it? Are we someone who continues steadfastly Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday? Philippians 4.13, the Apostle Paul himself, who we would say, hey, the Apostle Paul, man, he's the greatest example to us in many respects of a Christian who just stuck to it. He says, but I'm continually pressing toward the mark of the prize of the high call. The Apostle Paul knew if he stops serving, if he stops being involved, God's word, if he stops praying, stops well with God, he knew himself. What did he say in another portion of Scripture about himself as a sinner? Chiefest? He looked at himself as one of the chiefest. You know what? That kept him humble. That didn't allow him, as we would look at the apostle, you've arrived, the apostle. He would say, stop it. I have not arrived. I've still got a lot of work to do in my miserable life. I'm saved. I know I'm going to heaven. But if I stop walking with God, I could easily go back the other way. So we must understand that this idea of us quitting on God is not appropriate. That is not something the Spirit of God would have us do. I've actually had people say, well, pastor, we just needed a time out from church and you know, our family, we're just not going to be involved with any church anymore. We're just going to stay home. We're going to pray together. Listen, okay. Say, but that's not scriptural. The church is not in your home. Now, if you're starting a new church and going to purpose to establish, okay, but that's, you may not be called to that. Well, we just feel like, you know, the structure of the church, this and that, we're just going to do our own thing. Okay, that's not scriptural. Whether it's this church, find a church, go somewhere where there's a church meeting and trying to fulfill the mission of Christ. We're all a little different in how we practice things. Don't be so judgmental about that. But we find sometimes people think they're being spiritual by pulling away. And many times those people actually hurt themselves and their families in the long run. I'm going to say on this for my personal witness and testimony through the years. There's been a rare case or two where they got back involved with a good church and they learned you know what, that wasn't right, we shouldn't have done that. By their own testimony, they've confessed, yeah, we should have stayed faithful. I'm just saying, sometimes people think in a spiritual mind, well, we're just going to pull away. God didn't tell us to pull away. He said, stay faithful. Stay faithful. The attitude was a result of the Holy Spirit's influence in their life. Notice verse 46 and 47. 46, 47. And they continually, what? Daily, with one accord, in the temple, and breaking of bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved. So here was a very unique situation. Every single day. Now, was it every single person every single day? Probably not. But there were enough people where it says daily, these people, because of the empowering of the Holy Spirit, whether it was just the apostles and the groups they were with, but they were going out and telling people about their faith in Jesus Christ and how they could also come to a saving faith in Jesus Christ and it motivated them. Their attitude was joyful and it was exuberant and people said, what is it that you, what, what is it that you have? There's something about you that's different. And it wasn't that they had to just fake. It was generated by the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit of God made them a positive influence for Christ. Were they perfect? Absolutely not. As we read through the book of Acts, you're going to see there was a lot of flaws in some of these leaders too. But they had the initial, they wanted to be used of God, and they were willing to go out and express the truth that they found in, uh, because of the influence of the Holy Spirit. What about you and I? And I hit on this Sunday night, and so I'll just briefly touch this. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23. We call these, the, or the Bible refers to it as fruit of the Spirit. You say, how do you know if a Christian is really a spiritual Christian? Do they produce the fruit that the Spirit of God says they should produce? That's how you know. So 
So we're going to go through these real quick. Does the person you know that claims to be a Christian, are they loving? No? Then they're not walking with God. I'm not talking about a one moment, they had a bad, bad moment, maybe in a bad day. I'm just talking about when you look at their life, do they exhibit the love coming from the Spirit of God? No? Then there's a problem with their walk. Folks, this is, you're analyzing me. Now, we shouldn't go around analyzing everybody. What's your fruit today? You know, you match up on the fruit tree? You're, we know you're a fruit, but we're, you know, you're a nut too. All right. I'm not saying go around as a litmus. I'm just saying, you should know yourself. And please, this should all be personal inspection. I'm up here as the voice preaching this, but I'm not looking at you as I'm judging. I'm looking at this, Lord, where am I? Where, where is my fruit? Am I loving? That's an unconditional love. Do you have unconditional love for your friends, your family, for the person that was not kind to you? For the unsaved, are you unconditionally loving towards those that you don't line up with? This would solve so many problems in our churches. See, people leave churches for so many different reasons. Like, you know what? You could have settled that a long time ago if you just practiced the fruit of the Spirit. Now, I say practice it. The fruit is produced in you. These are the signs of the fullness of the Spirit in a person's life. Love. The second one, joy. Okay. Are you telling me I have to be happy when the kids are all paying the neck? No, I'm just saying, but in respect, the Spirit of God produces joy in our life. There's a deep abiding satisfaction. There's just a knowledge that I'm saved, that I'm going to heaven, and that should come out in your conversation. That should just be a natural thing for you to be a joyful person, not always negative. Now, our circumstances dictate. If I went to the hospital, they diagnosed me with some disease, they're like, Okay, this is a bad day. But at the same point, I know where I'm going. If I start to think, Lord, you're in charge of this. You created me. You, you saw me in my mother's womb. You obviously, this, this is not a surprise to you. I'd start figuring out ways to say, okay, God, you got this. Whether I had to go through chemo or had to go, okay, Lord, how do I, how do I deal with this? Would I have days where I cry? Would I have days where I look at my family? Sure I would. But at the same time, I would know my sovereign God is in charge of this. He wants me to live. He'll let me live. He wants me to die. He'll let me die. What am I going to do for him until that happens? It's a perspective. The Spirit of God can give you that perspective. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Again, folks, that's what the Spirit of God produces in, in a spiritual person. So whether it's a pastor who loses his temper... You know right away, okay, he's not walking with the Spirit today. I've been under those. Someone has no self-control. Well, obviously, had no self-control. They weren't walking in the Spirit. Now, you could keep this list and be a judgmental person, or you can just let God be God and deal with those people. But you have to understand something. If we truly say that we're God's people and we walk in the Spirit, we won't have to tell people. It will come out of us. It'll be something that is seen in us. Husbands and wives, you have issues with each other? Well, you don't know what he said to me. You don't know what she did to me. Your response should be spirit-led, not flesh-led. Your response to a fellow church member should not be fleshly, should be spiritual. But pastor, you don't understand what they said about my kid. I got five boys. They all grew up in church. There's been things said about our kids. Well, I'm quitting this church. People just don't understand. I mean, this is just, oh my goodness, I can't believe this, and I'm never going back there. You're the pastor. You have to go back. No, I'm going <laughs> to go find another church to pastor then. And that happens. That's wrong. Take it. Maybe they had the bad day, and it's not your kid. They're just having a bad day. A spiritual person would assess, would reason, would... And it might be. Hey, you're right. And I never made an excuse for my kid. You're right. He's having a bad day. He's a punk. I had to deal with it. All right. Be honest about it. Don't defend your kids if they're being bad. Don't defend yourself if you're being bad. Folks, this is just practical church 101. But listen, we can say it. It's different when it happens to you. But if you're not walking the Spirit, it'll be known pretty quickly. Now, some of you are just nicely demeanored people. Or you're not confrontational. Then others of you, you're not nicely demeanored, and you are confrontational. And somehow God said we all need to come together and be unified in his body. 
and he's elected leadership, pastors, elders, deacons to help manage all that. There's many times where I was like, I just want to be a church member. I don't want to have to deal with personalities. I don't want to have to be in this position. Why did I get put here? Oh, yeah, you put me here, didn't you? Oh, folks, we all have different tasks. We all have different positions. You could take shots at people, or you could say, Lord, that's their deal. Help me with mine. The Spirit of God working in us, working through us. The attitude of the Spirit continued steadfastly. The attitude was a result of the Holy Spirit's influence, not them just manufacturing. Next one, the program of the Spirit. The program of the Spirit, the Apostles' Doctrine. Look at verse 42 again. And they continued steadfastly in what? The Apostle Doctrine. Where do the Apostles get their doctrine? Three years walking with Jesus Christ. How would you like to go to that school? I would have loved to have my undergraduate education be underneath Jesus Christ personally. My first message in this introduction, I talked about the time in Luke where they spent time with Jesus. Jesus taught them the things he wanted them to know. That's the Apostle Doctrine. You say, well, where do we find the Apostle Doctrine? From Matthew to Revelation. That's the Apostle Doctrine. He's like, whoa, that's a lot of information. Okay, but there's key doctrines that we must agree upon as Christians in order to work together, in order to uh, have a focus, in order to have a church that operates together. And sadly, this has been so blown out of proportion since Jesus' church to the Catholic church to other cults and isms and schisms that have taken place to many different offshoots of Christianity. Why? Because men didn't walk with God. We're always correcting an issue here or there. And we still have it going on today. You know, people have left our church for the silliest reasons. Uh, if I start telling you, some of you might know who they are, so I don't want to say it. But I mean, there, there's been some really silly reasons. There have been some valid reasons, and I say this on their part, for leaving. But then there's been sin sinful reasons for people leaving. And then we have the typical reasons. People get moved from here to there. Jobs change, and they go somewhere else, or military move outs. But listen... The program of the Spirit of God was the Apostle Doctrine. Continually steadfasting, teaching Jesus' doctrine. Notice what it says in Matthew chapter 28. Matthew 28. Many of you only associate this with the Great Commission to go out and preach the gospel. But notice what Jesus actually says here in Matthew 28 verses 19 and 20. It wasn't just specifically... the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Here's Jesus' words, Go ye, therefore, talking to his disciples, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Verse 20. Teaching them to observe what? All things whatsoever I have commanded you. So it wasn't just Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, now get baptized. All things. That was that three-year time Jesus spent time with them, and after he ascended, teaching them more, and now we have the apostles receive revelation, direct revelation from God. We have the recorded epistles, so we can learn more how to operate God's church, the local church here in this earth. So we have the apostle doctrine. The apostles receive direct revelation from the Spirit of God to record the gospels or the epistles and the epistles. So what are the main doctrines or essentials that we must agree upon in order to maintain proper unity and mission? Well, in order for us to have some form of structure, I just wrote down a, a few here, and, and we can, and, and anyone here who knows a doctrine, boy, you can say, yeah, there's a bunch under that one, a bunch under this one, a bunch of that one. Okay, the Bible. How many English translations, somebody just throw it out, how many English translations do you think there are, the Bible, the Word of God? Since they started translating, how many do you think? Just Eng different English translations. I was shocked when I actually learned I, I didn't think it was this high. 450. Yeah, you guys gasped. I read, the, I read it, I was like, I don't remember. I can remember about 20. <laughs> so think about this. What's the church to do? Well, Pastor, we want this version. We want this version. We want this one. We, okay. You're never going to make everybody happy. You're just not. If that works for you and you're growing, praise God. But somebody's going to keep everyone on the same page too. Right? But the Bible is the word. That's this way. The Bible is the word of God. You say, what about the different translations? What if they don't translate a word? Listen, there's so much more detail behind that. That is not a quick, easy statement. But we also shouldn't be fighting about it. 
Thank you. Shouldn't be a fight. You know, we've had people leave our church because we weren't NIV only church. I was like, wait a minute. You're going to leave our church because we're not in it? And then we'll have somebody come, well, you're not this, you're not that. Like, and then we'll have people leave if we were to change. You're like, okay, what 450? I want to go back to one that nobody's ever heard about. <laughs> Say, well, turn in whatever it is. And come on. That's the God, the devil has used that to divide so many churches. That shouldn't happen. But we should agree that the Bible is the Word of God, and we need to have one that's a literal interpretation so we can understand for ourselves how to grow in our faith and to learn and to grow in that way. So much bigger topic. Some of you sitting there, you're like, okay, Pastor, you just opened up a can of worms. Right. God. I'll just say it like that. Well, there's a whole bunch of information under God, but we must agree on who God is. Salvation. What is salvation? Well, if you say, well, yes, you have to believe in Jesus, but my good works, all whoa, whoa, we just changed. No, salvation by grace through faith alone and the finished work of Jesus Christ. It's a simple way to say it, but there's a lot more information under that. But we must agree on the means of salvation. Church, must agree on the local church. Some people say, well, I'm a part of the universal church. Okay, great. How's that, how's that working for our local community? You cannot organize a universal church to get things done for the cause of Christ. It must be worked with boots on the ground, individuals reaching their community with the gospel of Jesus Christ. It must be organized. The Apostle Paul went from city to city, and in some cities, multiple churches establishing the pastors, elders, the leadership to go out and repeat what they were doing. It has to be established. Ordinances. Well, we believe there's two main ordinances. Some churches have many more. But when you read the New Testament, the Lord's Supper and baptism, two main ordinances. Prayer. Hmm. Churches are powerless because we don't pray. Christians are powerless because they don't pray. We're not sensitive to God's leadership because we don't pray. And mission. Having a collective mission. Knowing what the mission is. Knowing how to fulfill the mission. Knowing how to organize to get the mission done. Those are just my, off, off the top of my head, and I say off the top of my head. Bible, God, salvation, church, ordinances, prayer, mission. Those are the keys that we must agree. Now, are there more? Yeah, but we're not going to get into preferences. Dress standards. Give me a break. Some churches dress in shorts and t-shirts. Some churches dress in jeans and bib overalls. Some churches dress in three-piece suits and top hats and canes. And some people wear bonnets. Some people don't. Folks, do you think Jesus wants us arguing about that? Absolutely not. Every culture, every town, every church has its own little culture and some churches might be a little more conservative some churches might be less conservative that's their deal but if they're saved, they're brother and sister of Christ love them we wouldn't invite John the Baptist in our church to speak can you imagine if I invited a guy in that was in a camel hair outfit people would say pastor's really changing, look out, what's next pastor come on, just have fun with it but just really, we don't have to be so nitpicky Sunday nights, I don't wear a tie. Wednesday nights, I'm even more casual. When we have the men's camp out, I'm in shorts and a t-shirt. If you come visit me at 5 a.m. on Sunday morning, I'm in pajamas. <laughs> Get over it, people. Come on. We're all a little different. And I think the mixture is great. Have people that like a higher dresser. Have people that are right off the street and don't care. I'm good. Don't make that a litmus test for fellowship. In order to have unity in the church community, there must be agreement in doctrine and practice. And that's going to change from church to church. Let me just hit on this. We've had people get saved here, baptized here, grow here with us for a few years, then move with a military deployment or move to get a job somewhere else, and they call me back, Pastor, I'm so struggling. I've been to like five churches, but there's no church like Community Baptist Church. Okay, what's their context? They've only known this church. Should I find a church that says Baptist? Should I find a church that, you know, they, they don't have the same music, they don't have the same Bible? They don't, like, whoa, 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 whoa. I said, get a copy of their doctrine. Start there. What's their doctrinal position? The Word of God. What do they believe about the Word of God? What do they believe about God? What do they believe about and I go through that list. Now, start adding to it. If you don't feel comfortable with that kind of church, okay, find the one that you're more comfortable with. But listen, at some point, go sit down with the leadership team and explain your position and see if they agree with that. And can you see that you're, you know, as you pray, as you see God's face, can you see yourself serving and working there? 
we've made this too difficult. We should be much more uh, understanding that not every church is going to be the same. I have pastor friends that they do stuff at their church I would never do. They say, John, we would never do that at our church. What you do there? Just different personnel, different practices. But it's not doctrine. We're not talking about doctrine. We're just talking about how we practice things. In order to have unity in the church, church community, there must be agreement in doctrine and practice. Fellowship. Next one. Fellowship means communion, association, partnership. This is not based on a civilian community, not, not the mindset of, well, we're all, we're all part of the same community. No, we're talking about a spiritual community of believers. Spiritual fellowship based on our spiritual brotherhood and sisterhood. This fellowship is based on receiving his word, the gospel. I have met so many people in so many different places, different churches, even here. I know people in other churches that are godly, wonderful believers. And we, we, we disagree in a few areas. But guess what? They're going to be in heaven with us. I'm going to rejoice with them. I don't mind meeting with them, praying with them. But if we serve together, we might just have a few differences. That's the way it's going to be. But I'm not worried about that stuff. The danger in Christian fellowship. Turn with me because of the passage we're going to stay at for the last, for the, for the communion service. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Turn with me here. I'll wind it down right here. Our ushers will get prepared for the Lord's Supper. Verse number 17, 1 Corinthians eleven seventeen. 17. Here's the danger in some Christian fellowship. Now this... In this that I declare unto you, I praise you not. Here's the Apostle Paul writing to the church at Corinth, knowing that there's some issues going on in the church. And if you read the church, book of Corinthians, you see there's a lot of issues in the church of Corinth, similar to our day and age. I praise you not that you come together, not for the better, but for the worse. You're saying, hey, when you guys get together for fellowship, it's not for the better, it's worse. How would you like that to be a, a statement from the Apostle Paul to our church? Hey, Pastor John, just want you to know, when I came to your church, it wasn't good. What I saw was not good, John. You have people have divisions amongst themselves. You have people that are catering to their own needs, not worrying about the other in the church that have needs. They're not even praying with people when they talk about it spiritually. John, you've got a problem at your church. And that might be said from time to time about our church. We've had problems here and there. But that shouldn't be the totality. And God gave us a way of dealing with those problems. Matthew 18 very clearly tells us one-on-one, -on -one, we're going to go to a brother and sister and make those things right. If they refuse, and you've tried a number of times, then you take a witness with you, not a gossip, a true spiritual person that will help you try to fix that. If it's not fixed there, then again, after a few tries, you try again, you take it to the church leadership. Now we've got an issue. If they don't change their heart, then they're not supposed to stay in the church. That's sad. Why would a person be so proud, not willing to get something made right with another believer? You're a brother or sister in Christ. Why would you hold out on making things right? That's just wrong. It's unspiritual. So the Apostle Paul was pointing out an issue in this early church and the problems they were having. But then I want you to notice, so we're talking about fellowship. To have unity in the church community, we all must receive the Spirit through salvation. Proper fellowship in, with believers means genuine salvation. I've wondered from time to time why I can't connect with certain people who claim to be believers. I found out it's because they weren't truly saved. Didn't find out for many years afterwards, but I was like, boy, it's just so hard to connect with this person. Why? The more, the more you learn, the more you're around them, and sometimes a spotty get together here, they're just really, wow, they're, they're not a genuine believer. That's why there was no connection. Spirit couldn't bear witness with us. We couldn't really, we could talk about sports, we could talk about this, that, but spiritual things, just there was no traction. It could be because a person's not saved. Your, your fellowship with other believers needs to be based on the Spirit of God. So we recognize that as we study these things, it's important that we, we understand that fellowship is important. It's a vital aspect of church life. Fellowship was required, according to the apostles, continued steadfastly in what? The apostle doctrine. What else? Prayers, breaking your bread, fellowship. These were the keys. 
This is what kept that church unified, cohesive, working together for the cause of Christ. Some people say, well, I'm not a fellowship person. Well, then you're not a spiritual person. Well, I'm an introvert. Okay, well, work yourself out of that because God's called you to be a witness and he's called you to be a teacher if necessary. In order to have unity in the church community, there must be a spirit-led fellowship. Now, I say, a lot of you, we play sports together, we watch sports together, we've done camping trips together. That's all great. But in those conversations, there's a lot of talk about God, the Bible, different things. And it's a genuine, hey, let's, I'm struggling in this area. I'm struggling. Well, let's pray together. There's a genuineness, spirit-led fellowship with those believers. The breaking of bread, and this is where we're at right now. I mentioned prayer earlier. I could spend a lot of time on that. But breaking of bread means the Lord's Supper or the Lord's Table or communion. There's many ways people call it today. But we look here, Matthew 26, in the upper room, Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper in the upper room. He was talking prophetically about what was going to happen to him. And 1 Corinthians 11, now we're looking back. The Apostle Paul now is writing about it. And he says, here's how you prepare for the Lord's table. Now, first of all, he says you must be saved. We, we believe the implication or the inference is you must be baptized, or at least not in rebellion to be baptized. Why, why, would, why would you want to partake in the Lord's Supper if you're, you're rebelling against a clear command to get baptized? But then your heart and your spirit must be right. You must examine yourselves. Notice what it says here in verse number 26. As often as you eat this bread and drink of this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. And so you are promoting the testimony that Jesus Christ died for your sins. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man do what? Examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Here's where the church comes together for a time of fellowship around the Lord's table. We have grape juice, and we have an unleavened wafer, or a, a wafer without yeast in it. It represents the body of Jesus Christ, the blood of Jesus Christ, representation only. This does not turn into the literal body of Christ. Uh, Jesus' presence is in here with the body, with the blood. He's here present with us as, as believers. This is symbolic. When we partake of the Lord's table, what we're doing is saying, Jesus, you, I am so thankful to you that you died for me. Your blood was shed. Your body was abused. You were buried, but you rose again from the dead. This is a celebration. It's a memorial for us to, remember, to, to commemorate what Jesus Christ did for us as believers. And it should be a celebration. Say, well, we're celebrating his death. Yeah, but you don't know what that death brought. We're not celebrating just the death. We're celebrating the rest of it. The burial, the resurrection. He's, arrived, he's resurrected. We have hope now of heaven because of the resurrection. So it's a wonderful truth that the breaking of bread, in order to have unity in the church community, there must be true communion based on Jesus' sacrifice. Do we have true communion with other brothers and sisters in Christ? If you're a true believer, you have true communion. True fellowship, true understanding of one another. And the last one mentioned in Acts 2.42 is prayer. The early church started at a prayer meeting, Acts 1.14. Prayer was essential to their spiritual growth. They saw that. They continue in prayer. It's commanded to, for us to pray. Hebrews 4 tells us, let us come boldly before the throne of grace to find help in the time of need. God over and over and over again tells us, ask, seek, knock, and it shall be given. Prayer is something, is a way we communicate with God one-on-one. -on -one. You don't need a pastor or a priest. You get to talk directly to God. It's awesome. So as we look here at the breaking of bread, I want you to notice something. And, and gentlemen, if you come forward so we can get ready to pass this out quickly. In verse 24 and 25, it says, And when he had given thanks, talking about Jesus in the upper room, Paul's repeating what was said there. He said, Take, eat, this is my body, symbolic, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the same manner also, he took the cup, the juice, and he says, when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do ye as often as you drink it. And remember, see, a couple things to note in verse 25. One, he says, This is the New Covenant, the New Testament in my blood. He was saying, Symbolically, this represents my death, burial, and resurrection. This covenant, this new covenant, Jesus being the Savior, replaced the old covenant that he had the priests sacrificing and committing all those priestly duties. 
That was done when Jesus Christ offered up himself as the final lamb of God. Some people don't understand this about the Lord's Supper. So symbolically, we're saying, yes, Jesus, thank you. This doesn't have to be repeated. We don't have to keep getting saved and keep getting saved and keep getting... Your blood, your body was given for us. And you were resurrected to prove you were God and now to deliver us, to give us hope that we get to be resurrected someday too. But notice another thing it says here. This cup is the New Testament, new covenant in my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink it. Some people say, Pastor, how come you don't have communion every single service? Been in churches that do that. And just to be honest with you, when we started this church, I saw it done in a way that people got so used to it, they didn't care anymore. It was like, let's get this done, get out of here. And it just kind of, to me, it was just kind of a downer. So that could change at some time, but there's no command on how often. The scriptures here say, as often as you do it. I know some churches do it once a year. We do it once a quarter. And we spend time explaining it and have a special time about it like we're doing here. The message goes along with it. Some churches do it every week. Some churches do it once a month. It, that's practice. He doesn't tell us. And so there's liberty. Every church can do it the way they want. As long as they explain it properly, they understand who it's for. Does that make sense? So if your church you came from does it every week, praise God. Awesome. If I went to your church, I do it every week. If they do it once a year, I think that's a little less than I would want. I'd want it more, but okay, that's the way they do it. If that works for them, that works for them. Don't be so nitpicky as a Christian. Just go with it and just say, Lord, help our church to move forward. Help us to reach people with the gospel. Help us to do what we know is right to do. Well, I'm going to close this message. Noah's kind of more pastoral in the presentation of understanding and practice, but yet it's necessary as we get into the Lord's table here today. Let me pray. Well, Father, as we come to you now, as we close this part of the message, we know that you're an awesome God, and as we participate now in the Lord's table, we want to be honorable to you and glorify you. And so as the elements are being passed out, may the people look, knowing that the juice represents your blood, not literal, but it represents symbolically the, the cracker represents your body. You did this as an illustration to help us to be thankful and appreciate, and you told us to do this until you return. So, Lord, we ask that as we participate in this, that we understand that this does not do anything more, doesn't make us more spiritual. It is just something you've told us to practice to remember and to celebrate what you did on our behalf as those who have trusted Jesus Christ as our Savior. Would you help us to take time to examine our own hearts and confess anything, make things right? If there's someone in this room that has a problem or an issue with another brother and sister in Christ, may they make time to make that right and not hold grudges. Please work in our hearts now, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.